quite... <laughs> Sorry. Hello. Welcome to... Well, I wanted to call it, is Han Solo a humanist? But it's a look at the ethics and the religion and the theology of Star Wars. A London Thinks event to explore the religious beliefs um, and all the ideas in the Star Wars films. Can I assume you've all seen The Force Awakens now? You, because otherwise there will be spoilers. Um, <laughs> and we are live streaming this. Um, there's a Twitter hashtag which I think is London Thinks if you want to tweet about it. And if you could keep your phones on silent there, that would be good. Um, we'll be unpicking some key scenes, characters and ideas with an illustrious panel of superior minds to whom I shall introduce you shortly. But unfortunately, due to copyright reasons, like Ray scavenging on Jakku, I've had to find a way to explore this universe, improvising with found materials. Um, and I have redoubled my efforts um, at home with my own Death Star crew, so I made a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is, can, I, can I go to it? Right, do I? No, this person should come up. Shouldn't, okay. So I did it in yellow. So, so if imagine it coming towards you. Um, oh, and I should say, I'm Samira Ahmed, and um, people didn't know until now that I've seen, I've seen The Force Awakens four times. <laughs> right, so um, I've had to use some posters as well. Um, right, I'm going to show you the first thing. Okay, this is my son's Lego Death Star. Wow. And he let us borrow it, and my husband took the photos, and my daughter helped. So um, if you're watching at home, thank you. Um, and I also want to thank my BBC colleague, Luke Doran, who's provided his Lando Calrissian figurine, which you will see constructing a key moment of ethical conflict from episode five later, but it's not Lego. <laughs> Now, you may have noticed there are no actual priests on this panel, uh, that's because Giles Fraser, who was planning to be here, had to miss tonight. He suddenly sensed a great disruption in the force, i.e., it's Maundy Thursday. <laughs> One dinner party that vicars are not allowed to miss for any reason. So imagine us, if you will, as benign warriors on the Jedi Supreme Council, or perhaps as Imperial commanders convening a council of war on the original Death Star. I'll introduce them all. Andrew Copson is head of the British Humanist Association. He and I once got talking about how prophecy and chosen ones were ruining science fiction. Um, and the knowledge of core source materials is strong in this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Francesca Stavrakopoulou is professor of Hebrew Bible and ancient religion at Exeter University. She won her place on this council by revealing that she live tweeted along to the Indiana Jones films on TV over Christmas, um, pointing out that her first book was on human sacrifice. And she also told me, my medieval theology tutor at Oxford, who was a nun, used Star Wars as a way of explaining Gnosticism. Yes, <laughs> Matthew Sweet is a cultural historian and broadcaster. He dabbles with the dark arts as presenter of free thinking on Radio 3 and the Philosopher's Arms on Radio 4, amongst other things. And I think his children once drew a picture of him, revealing that he devotes 80% of his conscious mind to thinking about science fiction. <laughs> Particularly Doctor Who. It was Doctor Who. It was a phrenological diagram. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome, my Jedi Council. <laughs> right. Our first scene. <gasps> okay. <clears throat> and I know we've, we've Grand Moff Tarkin is in the wrong position. Um, so this is from Star Wars, and I thought would help us set up a discussion about what are all the religious beliefs in there. So. Um, we're going to read it. <laughs> We're going to act it out. So this is script one. <laughs> script one. It won't take too long. Then we'll get talking. Sorry. Um, so the Imperial commanders are holding a council meeting. Until this battle station is fully operational, we are vulnerable. The Rebel Alliance is too well equipped. They're more dangerous than you realise. Dangerous to your Starfleet commander, not to this battle station. The Rebel... The rebellion will continue to gain support in the Imperial Senate so long as... Grand Moff Tarkin walks in with Darth Vader to take his place at the table while Vader stands threatening next, next to him. Um, <laughs> the Imperial Senate will no longer be of any concern to us. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. The last remnants of the Old Republic have been swept away. That's impossible. How will the Emperor maintain control without the bureaucracy? <laughs> <laughs> the regional governors now have direct control over their territories. Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. And what of the rebellion? If the rebels have obtained a complete technical readout of this battle station, it is possible, however unlikely, that they might find a weakness and exploit it. <laughs> so, 
the plans you refer to will soon be back in our... I'm not a very good actor. <laughs> will soon be back in our hands. Very good. Thank this you. Is, this, I think it's better in the original West Country. <laughs> <laughs> Any attack made by the rebels against this station would be a useless gesture, no matter what technical data they've obtained. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed. The ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of the Force. Don't try to frighten us with your sorcerer's ways, Lord Vader. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion has not helped you conjure up the stolen data tapes or given you clairvoyance enough to find the rebels' hidden fortress. <laughs> I find your lack of faith disturbing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Enough of this. Vader, release him. As you wish. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, mm. so. <laughs> <laughs> so straight away, we have this idea that some people regard it as this hokey old religion. What have you unpicked watching it with all your religious insight into what's going on in the way the Jedi are presented? What are the religious ideas in there? It's absolutely classic appeal to an archaic, um, ancient religion that is somehow innate and has been there ever since the beginning of time. And that's something that only the initiated, the elites, uh, by means of a revelation of some kind of divine wisdom, can access and understand. And it's great in that what Darth Vader's doing, I love Darth Vader, I always have done, but what he's doing in particular is that he's resisting the idea, it doesn't matter, this is all about human hubris, and the idea about technology and advancement and science, and the idea that it doesn't matter what kind of achievements you make or what kind of wisdom you think that you have as human beings, ultimately there is a much more um, ancient, much more eternal and a much more authoritative religious force that goes back right into the archaic beginnings of time and that's what he's able to get into. And in terms just of the kind of religious ideas that we see in the Star Wars films, I was thinking straight away Darth Vader is a kind of um, warrior monk, isn't he? You know, sort of those, those orders on Malta and things like that. Yeah, but I think it goes beyond that. I mean, because it goes back to the whole idea of holy war, which we find in, you know, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, and we obviously find it in the Quran. Uh, so it's the idea that it, it's this sense that somehow you fight on behalf of a divine power, that your God or gods are divine warriors, and that as their worshippers, you are expected to manifest their presence by means of destruction of the enemy. Okay. What other things have you noticed? I was also thinking about things like, you know, this concept of celibacy, which is sort of in there for, you know, if you're a proper Jedi, you're not supposed to be yeah. part of the, the temporal world. Um, but also this whole Japanese idea of um, a kind of communing with spirits. I don't know what things like that have jumped out at you. Don't the, don't the Japanese commune more with their, with their people than with their own ancestors? Mm, yeah, I don't think yeah. it's quite like that. I think it's a lot more like a sort of you know, pre-monotheistic, almost animistic or pantheistic religions where sort of it's all, there's an interconnected... Francesca can tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm um, face, but there's sorry. a sort of in, interconnected um, sense of, of nature and there being a force in everything which might manifest itself in certain ways, but as written into... Because, I mean... The, the force and so on, although there's people who are very sceptical of it in, in, in the scene that we've just described and in that period, that's really just because it hasn't manifested itself for a long time. Once it does, I mean, there's nothing magical about it. It's, it's, it's something that's a part of the natural universe well, in well, this it story. Doesn't, it doesn't seem to have any power of its own. I mean, the, the idea of a sort of universal force through living things, it's, it's central to Hindu belief, for example, the idea of Atman and that that's everyone is part of it. Are there things that jump out at you, just in general, in the theology of what, the stuff they talk about? What puzzles me um, about the argument in this scene is why it needs to be demonstrated, why faith is required. I mean, whatever this arcane knowledge is, it's clearly they've clearly been keeping it to themselves for a very long time and not disseminating through it through the whole of the of the empire. Because it seems to me that it's something that can be demonstrated empirically quite easily. Yeah. You know, yes, you, you're right. you, you if, perform exactly. this act of strangulation. Why is this? Why is this? Only happened today. It's a sudden surprise. I don't understand yeah. how the um, how the skeptics can maintain their skeptical position <laughs> in the in the Star Wars universe, and why and, and in a way a lack of faith is disturbing. <laughs> no faith at all is required. It's just there it's in the faith. room. It's not faith. It? 
that is true. Um, some of the other things in there, I've, I've just a uh, film poster, some of the Jedi's alleged powers, which are achieved, achieved through training, but then it turns out, and I think in the prequel, that essentially it's DNA, you're kind of born with it. There's telekinesis, isn't it? The ability to move objects. Um, there's ESP sensing when someone is hurt or where they are, but not usually useful enough to stop something <laughs> no. happening. Um, and the other one I noticed is psychometry, which I think is only in The Force Awakens, which is touching objects and sensing their history, which is the lightsaber that um, Ray touches. Um, any thoughts on that? Because that's, that's all in that territory of... Um, it's not religious necessarily, is it? It's, it's in this territory of what? No, it's, it's religious. Of course it's religious. It's all about the notion of uh, using certain sorts of divine given gifts. So it's not, you know, so for example, it's not, it's not like prophecy. So it's no. not as if, um, you know, prophecy isn't predicting the future. Prophecy is about providing some kind of religious, social, cultural commentary um, by being some kind of a mouthpiece or an, an access to the divine and therefore helping somebody to make a choice. You show them the choice. If you behave like this, this will happen. If you behave... so, but things like telekinesis, you know, it's very common. It's the idea of like complete bodily and person, the transformation of your personhood in some ways. And we see that all over lots of different religions. Mm. And so too, touching objects mm. and dis discerning some kind of personhood almost about yeah. those objects, the, the, the story and of that, those and objects. That, myst that mystical thinking is not just religious. I mean, there's almost no one here, if you ask them, right, take. So I've got, you know, um, a bit of amethyst that my uh, grandmother brought back from Africa when she was young and she gave it to me. There's almost no one who would say, yes, I would accept um, a completely accurate replica of that bit of amethyst as being exactly the same thing with the same meaning. Mm. You, know, there's all, you always associate objects with yeah. the history and things that have happened They've to them. They've got their own lives. Even though it's identical, exactly. The low-level nature, though, that you, of the power of the force that you mm. mentioned, Samira, seems significant to me. We get these set pieces where people are choked or thrown across the room or pressure put on them in some mysterious way. But apart from that, it does seem to be something that produces kind of twinges every so often or vaguer kind of sensations. And I wonder whether that's not because this, you know, this first film, it's a product of the late 70s. Everybody was into this sort of thing in the late yes. 70s, yeah, yeah. dowsing for things. You know, I got uh, uh, my part work. I think issue two of The Unexplained came with the free ESP cards on yes. the front of it. And I think it's a product of that. You know, we're talking, this is a film shaped by a kind of Californian sensibility. But that's too, why it's weird I that think. Darth Vader is the person who's saying the thing that people would have been right on with, you know, he's saying like, oh, your, your technology and your science, that's nothing, what about the force? Look, watch me bend this spoon. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And but it is being... spoon bending, that's <laughs> what it is, I think it's a species no, right. of spoon bending. Um, I want to do another little scene, because you mentioned prophecy just now, and I want to do the scene where Luke um, meets Obi-Wan Kenobi, and they're on Tatooine, and they go back to his house. Now, we have uh, this is script three, I think. Three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have cunningly inserted an extra line. I wonder if you can spot it. Ooh. Okay, does everyone know who they are? Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, my father didn't fight in the Clone Wars. He was a navigator on a spice freighter. That's what your uncle told you. He didn't hold with your father's ideals. Thought he should have stayed here and not gotten involved. You fought in the Clone Wars? Yes. I was once a Jedi Knight, same as your father. I wish I'd known him. <laughs> <laughs> He was the best star pilot in the galaxy and a cunning warrior. I understand you've become quite a good pilot yourself. <laughs> and, he was, and he was a good friend. Which reminds me, I have something here for you. Your father wanted you to have this when you were old enough, but your uncle wouldn't allow it. He feared you might follow Obi-Wan on some damn fool idealistic crusade like your father did. You're going to be C-3PO? You're going to be C-3PO? What would that mean? Yes, sure. Sir, sir, if you'll not be needing me, I'll close down for a while. Sure, sure, go ahead. What is it? <laughs> I'm working for my BAFTA here. <laughs> it's your father's lightsaber, the weapon of a Jedi Knight, not as clumsy or random as a blaster, an elegant weapon for a more civilised age. He killed 30 children with it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you were that for, sort of for, <laughs> for over a thousand years, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the Old Republic, before the dark times, before the Empire. How, how did my father die? A young Jedi named Darth Vader, who was a pupil of mine before he turned to the evil, helped the Empire hunt down and destroy the Jedi Knights. He betrayed and murdered your father. Now the Jedi are all but extinct. 
Vader was seduced by the dark side of the Force. The Force? The Force is what gives a Jedi his powers. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us, penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was not very good. Um, your C-3PO was better than my... Uh, the most D2. immoral character in the whole of Star Wars, o Obi-Wan Kenobi. So I think we might have Definitely. spotted the extra line. Yeah. I <laughs> um, and it is really interesting, isn't it? Because, so this is my big thesis, which is that um, Obi-Wan Kenobi is essentially a radical preacher who's preying on vulnerable teenagers. <laughs> you know, orphan boy. And, and it just begins this process of recruitment, you know, by, by starting to tell him this, this selective story and sends him off to join this terrorist cell which yeah. is attacking a government yeah. installation. Yeah. Um, have I got another slide? Hang on, what have I got next? Oh, hang on. No, no. No. We'll come back to that in a minute. There's no, there's no, um, difference. There's, there's no difference between what Obi-Wan Kenobi does to Luke and what the Chancellor does to Anakin. They're both treating them completely as uh, means to their own ends, they set them on the path that they've decided. They warp and conceal the truth from them and give them half lies and manipulate them to try and weaponize them and send them out there. So a bit like God with Jesus and Judas. I was going there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, can you just um, do that thing? I want to show a slide at this point, a different one. We might, I've got them ordered. Um, right, can I move it around now? Uh, okay, you can start, show it now. So um, oh, yeah. this is that scene from um, Star Wars when they're having that fight and he's just rescued the princess and about to get the Millennium Falcon and he suddenly <coughs> sees that Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi are fighting and what does Obi-Wan Kenobi do? He basically martyrs himself in an act of suicide in front of Luke as the final act of his radicalization. Yeah. <laughs> no! And then we know what, we know what happens. Yeah. Um, I think it's... And you know that... I think that I'm persuaded by this theory. What... what <laughs> What, what um, troubles it slightly is that it all arises from, um, from planets where w that we're looking at through a, through a very heavily Orientalist eye. Exactly, wow. yeah, the Orientalism <laughs> of this Edwards, series. I don't know whether awesome. Edward Said ever saw Star Wars. It's unlikely. Um, but I think he might have added an extra chapter to Orientalism <laughs> if he had done, because when we go into the, to the cantina, we're in like an American's nightmare aren't we, of, mm. the, of, the, uh, of the Oriental? It's well, can I just say, you know that after 9-11, one of the White House advisors said that London was like the bar scene from Star mm. Wars. That is a quote. <laughs> because it was full of Islamists hanging out, and there was, you know, there was normally being policed by, um, by the British security services, but actually they could just plot and do whatever they liked. And it didn't matter who shot first, you know. But we see that othering in other, in other characters too, though, don't we? So in Chewbacca, I mean, completely othered. He's the kind of a bit thick, but he's just there. He looks completely other, but he's just there to kind of be the bulk. He's loyal. infantilized. He's he, uh, he's loyal, loyal, but, I mean, yeah. that's, no, that's, but that's, a, that's, yeah, loyal. that's a Western, yeah. a very Western value. But same with Yoda. Even Yoda is this completely orientalized and othered mm. character in the sense that, you know, he, he can't even speak properly. You know, <laughs> we think that this is hilarious, but actually it's, it's a really clever device as to try to caricature this sort of pseudo quasi Eastern sort of philosophical tradition. What's interesting is, because I think of the Thief of Baghdad and all those great... I mean, you could argue they were Orientalists, but they were actually great fantasies when the Middle East, and particularly this idea of Baghdad in the Golden Age, was actually the fantasy escape of Western literature. And that whole sequence of escaping from Tatooine and the bazaar is kind of that. Except if you think about the Arabian Nights and those kinds of stories out of Islam, they're not about um, being born, ultimately, that you're a secret... Um, Prince, you're actually, you are a beggar boy in the bazaar, and you might get caught up in this amazing adventure. Yeah. And what I find really depressing about the Star Wars films is, in the end, everyone turns out to be aristocracy, don't yeah. they? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's yeah. all that one family yeah. Yeah. causing all the trouble. And but the virgin birth thing they started to throw into the prequels Perhaps well. it's yeah. more like, because we've got these, these Orientalist clichés and this sense of the exotic and the seductive and the exciting um, uh, exotic, and also the exotic, where, where actually one of people's um, principal qualities, apart from the fact that they need to be subtitled, is that they're all really interested in money. Um, and with, then we've got the presence of all of the, of the stormtroopers and, and Darth Vader. We're actually maybe in a kind of Casablanca. Yes. Um, and in which, I guess, um, uh, we've got... Um, 
um, Han Solo as the as the nearest we could find to Rick yeah. in the story, a person who moves from a position of of of, uh, of cynicism to to one of idealism. So maybe that's the model underneath of it all. Um, because if we, I mean, if we go with the jihadist thing, I think we're slightly. I mean, it's present, it's present, and it's certainly present for us. And these things become um, become enmeshed together, and in in later films we can detect its presence um, and 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 call it what it is. But when we're talking about something that's being conceived in the really in the mid seventies, I think you know we maybe need to look look elsewhere. Well, people too. say it actually. You could argue a lot of people watch Star Wars growing up, and it actually normalised the idea of this kind of actors mm. as heroic. I want to show you the next one. So, um, oh, this is sweet oh. Kylo Ren. Um, I like him. I know. Well, there's a couple of things here. One is that the Pope said that there wasn't enough evil in this film, because, of course, he's quite sympathetic. But if I can show you the next slide. <laughs> this brings us back to the whole idea of the, you know, the, the vulnerable teenager what who's radicalised. What magnificent ears. <laughs> I love it. I just, I just love the way they've done that job. Um, but, yeah, I just wondered if anyone had any thoughts about, particularly the way they've taken on this jihad theme in The Force Awakens, where mm. he's got an idea, hasn't he? He's basically self-radicalised in his bedroom, and he's got souvenirs. It's equivalent to having Darth Vader's helmet. It's equivalent of looking at really terrible mm. videos online. I mean, I don't want to trivialise what's a terrible situation, but it's a really interesting theme, isn't it? I think that... I, oh, no, absolutely. And I think that idea of it happening in a private space, unsurveyed mm. even by the other villains yeah. in the story, um, feels like it does connect with that idea. Mm. Very Do you know much. what? He is it, a boy in his bedroom, mm. isn't he? Yeah. It was, you know, I, I hope this isn't sort of insensitive or inappropriate to say um, today, but I was reading this morning about, um, you know, they found one of the laptops from one of the Brussels bombers, and Supposedly, you know, he has said, um, I don't know what to do, I'm under pressure. I, and that's almost that, it, it, you know, thinking about this Star Wars, you know, particularly the last, the recent film, it was almost like I, it made me want to believe that scene on the bridge, sorry about spoilers, with Han Solo, when he says, help me, I want you to help me, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And Han said, of, of course I'll help you. And it almost made me, it, I don't know, it made me, just because this was on my mind, I rethought... That scene in the light of the Brussels attack. And absolutely, and again, you know, no attention to being um, in, at all insensitive in such a terrible week, but the number of mothers in particular, parents in this country, who have who've had to turn their children into the security mm. services when they've found out, and then that, that worry about, you know, were they genuinely radicalised or were they just... Um, experimenting mm. and you know, just looking at dangerous stuff. Um, it's it's quite moving actually. Um, mm. I want to. Can you just pause it? I want to just take us back a couple of slides. Um, am I right to flick around? Sorry, I'm going to go back to this one. Right, we can show this now. So I want to look at the concept of evil. And this is sort of Brian, my husband, tried to get the blue lightning out of the emperor's hands. This is from the end of. Oh yeah. <laughs> so thank you. I, I thought it was a good. Was. We, we improvised. <laughs> so this is the end of Return of the Jedi when there's a big showdown and Luke has decided that. I can go on, you know, I can go and save my father. There is still good in him, I sense it. Um, in fact, I think we have this scene, don't we? Should we read it quickly? I think it's script two. Let's go for it. Oh, so I should just say, Luke has just cut off his father's hand in front of the emperor, who is goading him to use his anger. Oh, I'm Luke. You are. Good. Your hate has made you powerful. Now fulfil your destiny and take your father's place at my side. Oh, Luke looks at his father's mechanical hand, then to his own mechanical black-gloved hand, and realises how much he's becoming like his father. He makes the decision for which he has spent a lifetime in preparation. Luke steps back and hurls his lightsaber away. Never! I'll never turn to the dark side. You failed, Your Highness. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. So, I'll read, I'll read the stage direction. Could the Emperor's <laughs> glee turns to rage. Watch this. So be it, Jedi! <laughs> Oh, and you keep if going. you will not be turned, you will be destroyed. Blinding bolts of energy, evil lightning shoot from the Emperor's hands at Luke. The wounded Vader struggles to his feet and moves to stand at his master's side. Young fool, only now at the end do you understand. Your feeble skills are no match for the power of the dark side. You have paid the price for your lack of vision. Oh, Father, please <laughs> help me. Again, Vader stands watching Luke. He looks at his master, the Emperor, then back to Luke on the floor. Now, young Skywalker, you will die. 
Now, we know that he doesn't. And I you notice how they've stopped applauding these now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason I chose this, I thought there was some really interesting um, stuff going on. It seems like Lucas suddenly decided to be, dare I say, a certain kind of Christian. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to engage in violence. But That's not he then ropes in his dad and says, actually, you have to kill the emperor for me because I'm not going to do it myself. She tries to have it both ways. But you're saying it's not Christian. No, it's not exclusively Christian. No. This is one of the big problems with Christianity, you know, one of a number. Um, and uh, it seeks to claim an, an exclusive right, an exclusive ownership over certain sorts of moral positions or ethical positions that actually are, are, are very common in various other sorts of socio-religious and cultural contexts. What I find more interesting mm -hmm. is the right-hand thing. Okay. Because anthropologically, um, what's particularly interesting is that in... in a number of cultures, ancient and, and modern, and, and all over the place, um, the right hand represents life and the left hand represents death. This is why in subcultures you eat with your right hand and you wipe your bum with your left hand. That's right. um, and so it's really interesting, you know, so this kind of stuff is replicated. So when you look at icons um, of ancient, you know, pre monotheistic deities, they've often got their right hand raised mm. in blessing. That's why in Jesus icons, he's often doing this right handed stuff. Um, and so it's interesting that, this, that the, it's the right hand that's been sort of cut off. It's this sense of somehow life or the light or the way mm. of living has gone. Um, and the sort of the, what's left is kind of death and darkness. And yet what happens in this scene is that obviously we see Luke's sort of mechanical hand and you start to think, well, has he actually lost the way of life? Is he sort of now in this liminal position, which this scene seems to, nice. to represent? That's with my anthropology hat on. No, that's good. And Thanks. That, 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 that's actually a very good point, isn't it? And then Darth, it's ironic in a way that Darth Vader in the, in the first scene that we did is so down on technology when he's half, you know, robot. Half, yeah, really, more than half, really, more, more yeah, than yeah. half, Way more than half, yeah. Because from, from, from it's what's time. making him, that's what gives him his personality. So maybe that's the first chink into his indec indecisive nature, the fact that he might turn back, the fact that he's rejecting that uh, technology that he's, even though he's made of it. What about the concept of evil in the Star Wars films? I mentioned earlier that the Pope had criticised The Force Awakens for not having a proper sense of evil. Um, you have the sense that the Emperor is entirely malign. It's a caricature, really. I think that's the problem yeah. with it. It's just, it's just like, here is the Emperor, he is evil, here is some evil music, look at him, look at him, he's in shadows, really evil. Look how ugly you know, he is yeah, as well, because evil is ugly. He's got all those yeah. sort of... I think one downsides. of the reasons why Star Wars was such a hit, why it was so attractive, is because it offered, it's the most, in a way, a profoundly simple moral view of the universe. We're teasing out some of its complexities here, but the appeal of that first film was that it was utterly, utterly simple. Black cats Good and versus hats. evil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, audiences who had been who were, who were tired of, of watching films about, or that referred to Vietnam, tired of films about paranoia. We don't want the parallax view again. We don't want to be troubled. We don't want to, uh, we don't want to be burdened with all this knowledge we have of the corruption of our president. We want an escape into some other simpler moral world that refers back to the golden age of Hollywood. Um, and the, the sort of moral simplicity you get in a film like The Adventures of Robin Hood, which I think is the, is the closest film to mm. this. But it's a shame because this whole idea of the Force, and then the Empire Strikes Back, you know when he go, Luke gets trained and he goes into that forest and he's told that you're only taking what you take with you and he, he has that sort of fantasy sequence where he kills Darth Vader and he sees his own face in it. There's something of that Japanese idea of conflicting forces of light and dark, whereas if you watch much Japanese kind of fantasy cinema, there's no sense of it being good or evil. It's just a sense of a opposing forces mm. and this lacks that that nuance doesn't it it is you say it is it's heavy-handed with a good versus evil well, rather than a light versus dark it's partly because it's ultimately a, a very nostalgic piece isn't it it's a lament for some lost culture of goodness a, a, a kind of a utopia where things worked which has been taken over by these dark forces and that I think is filmmakers reflecting on a on a past when the film business was a slightly easier place to navigate when it's mm. when its powers were were more stable and it wasn't uh, the incoherent 
tottering, doomed-seeming uh, mm. professional environment that it was in the mid-70s. And it's much easier, actually, to be nostalgic about something than to portray it. I mean, I don't think that the Republic or even the, the full Jedi Council really are that impressive in the first three films. I think it was like the think... League of Nations between the wars. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, you do. You look at it, you don't think, oh, this wonderful golden age, they were right to want to go back to it in, <laughs> in episode four. You think, what a useless, tottering nonsense that, mm. you know... Um, um, because once you start to portray it, it all falls down. I wanted to give a specific thing that came, and it was actually a suggestion that came from Twitter. Uh, I'm going to go back to, to the slide I've shown before, this one. And actually, yeah, it's, it's that one. And, oh, sorry, go back to that one. Go back to that one. Um, it's actually a quote from, um, you know the bit when they're planning the attack on the Death Star in Star Wars, and they're talking about how big the port is. And Luke says, I used to bullseye womp rats in my T-16 back home. They're not much bigger than two metres. Now, killing animals for gratuitous pleasure is the first step in the making of a serial killer. <laughs> is That's it true. not? That's true. And, and again, thank you to whoever pointed it out on Twitter, but it's, um, it's really interesting. There's casual things that are thrown in there, which are actually really disturbing to modern sensibilities. That is, it depends what we think a womp rat is and why he was shooting. It should have been a humane trap and it could have been released into Quite the wild. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Were they things that drank the water? From the uh, oh, were they? Yeah, I don't know. I'm just I'm asking you. I don't know. I Do we know? know? Does anybody That's know? The, Does anybody know? Does anyone know? Is it a swamp yes. rat? Oh, the S knocked off. Sorry. Yes. They're, they're a small mammal. But why would they? But what why? Would they, why would they break them open? What harm would they do? To get at the water. Oh, right. So they. So they're but they're basically commodified. Well, this, it, this adds it, weight to your theory, it this, but he clearly theory, did it gratuitously. Is that, you know, it's gratuitously shooting them when they are a valuable source of water, mm. as it seems even worse, um, I think. Right, I want to show... Well, first, actually, does anyone have any particular theories they want to present about Star Wars? And then I'm gonna, we're going to talk about this slide. You can work out which scene this is in the meantime. Right. What have you got any, what, any theories about... You've got a theory about well, Pope and Star Wars, haven't you? <laughs> Well, I think I, I was thinking about this, and I, I feel it might just have been inadvertently triggered by the fact that Pope Benedict did genuinely look so so like the emperor. <laughs> That's not a theory. I, I, feel, I feel, in retrospect, I might have deduced too much from this uh, I thought, striking I go, I go resemblance. Back to that one of, um, um, the but emperor. I did think, I to that. Okay. yeah, there you go. There's Pope. I Benedict. thought you had a theory about the, the Counter Reformation. No, well, you've added that. I'll say what my original okay. theory was, and your embellishment is much more interesting, <laughs> is that I think that the, 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 the thing that the, the most obvious uh, religious metaphor, I think, or symbolism in the whole of Star Wars is that the Empire is actually the Christian church. I think that that's what it is. They've replaced this sort of nature-based, quite diverse religion with a monotheism. Darth Vader is basically the Spanish Inquisition, and uh, the, emperor, the emperor is God. A so cruel and vengeful a, God. A leader of the Counter-Reformation, which also fits with this whole version of the Arthuriad um, in the kind of later retellings, like a Marion Zimmer Bradley's, where the ancient pagan religion of England is threatened by Christianity, and right. it's being enforced by the likes. Right. Um, having of said that, having said that, I think there's an awful lot um, within in the, the, the original three that suggests a much more um, anti-material, anti-natural world kind of perspective. So it's really working on this massive dichotomy between the soul on the one hand, which is the force, so, and all its kind of divine sort of spiritual associations, and the body and the natural world on the other. So it says, oh yeah, the force is something that binds all living things together. But you know there's that scene with Yoda just before Luke descends into what I think is the underworld, when he has this kind of vision when, of, yeah, you know... when he goes to the forest that's exactly. strong in the dark side. And so he sort of descends into the underworld, yeah. very yeah. common trope yeah, in most yeah, religions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Yoda says um, to him, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not this, it's not, you know, this your gross flesh. Matter. Yeah, it's yeah, not your matter, it's all matter. about what's in your mind. And so there's a massive rejection, almost, of a way of saying that the force transcends um, materiality, it transcends the natural world, it transcends all of this. And I, that's why I don't like it, okay. because I just think that you can't, this kind of dualistic kind of dichotomy um, is ultimately problematic, and that's probably the reason why Darth Vader can't get on with his metal suit. It probably is, yeah. yeah. Is. Right, I want to talk a bit about Han Solo now. Oh. Right. Yeah, is. Where is he? Right, okay. Has anyone worked to what scene this is? Which film? Sorry? It's on the Millennium Falcon, yeah. Um, it's, you're yeah, gone. Sorry. That's right. 
Brilliant. We're going to act it out for you. So this is when we'll they're the on the Millennium Star. Falcon in Star Wars and they're on their way Four. to the Death Star. Am I right? Aldron. 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 Yeah, that's right. And they get there. It's not there. Okay, sorry. I do remember this film. And Luke is training and Han Solo is quite cynical. Um, which one is it? I think, I think it's number four. It's number four. Okay. Luke stands in the middle of the small hold area. He seems frozen in place. A humming lightsaber is held high over his head. Ben watches him from the corner, studying his movements. Han watches with a bit of smugness. Remember, a Jedi can feel the Force flowing through him. You mean it controls your actions? Partially, but it also obeys your commands. Suspended at eye level, about ten feet in front of Luke, a seeker, a chrome baseball-like robot, it hits Luke in the leg, causing him to tumble over. Han lets loose a burst of laughter. Hokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. You don't believe in the Force, do you? Kid, I've flown from one side of this galaxy to the other. Didn't you know he was from Yorkshire, did you? I've seen <laughs> a lot of strange stuff. But I've never seen anything to make me believe there's one all-powerful force controlling everything. There's no mystical energy field that controls my destiny. Ben smiles quietly. It's a lot of simple tricks and nonsense. I suggest you try it again, Luke. This time, let go your conscious self and act on instinct. <laughs> Laughing. With the blast shield down, I can't even see. How am I supposed to fight? Your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. Han sceptically shakes his head as Ben throws the seeker into the air. Stretch out with your feelings. That's just so awful. I mean, it's just like... <laughs> it's just the, it's the worst hokey nonsense. OK. Stretch out with your feelings. Oh, Luke stands in one place, seemingly frozen. The seeker makes a dive at Luke, and incredibly, he managed to deflect the bolt. The ball ceases fire and moves back to its original position. You see, you can do it. Han? Han? Oh, sorry. Uh... You're so laid back. <laughs> I call it luck, babe. I call it luck. <laughs> I call it luck. Thank you. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. Look, going good against remotes is one thing. Going good against the living, that's something else. So the key line here is, hokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side kit. And Han Solo just seems to be... He's actually the one who gets everything done. And he's the one who um, kind of makes a moral journey, doesn't he? Because he changes from being just out for himself to actually doing stuff for his friends. Mm. And yet we know that in The Force Awakens, there's that scene, which is in the trailer, which is, you know, it's all true. All which is the biggest disappointment ever. I mean, I didn't like him particularly when he was just like, yeah, it's all mumbo-jumbo. Because obviously that's suggesting that he's not really engaging with his friends he, and he can't be in a world and, and see that world in different ways. I think one of the most valuable things that we can do as human beings or as, um, you know, in Star Wars universe is to be able to engage other worlds and imagine being in a world in a different kind of way than, than our own. So that is the biggest letdown of all. I can't believe that he ends up saying it's all true. No wonder he gets killed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But he's, no. He, but but yeah. he's, he's seen it. He's seen it happen. He's seen it all. He's seen the evidence of his own eyes repeatedly throughout his life. His own son, you know, is, is, is a master of the force. So, of course, he's, he's done the right thing in changing his views to, to fit the evidence. Is that the right thing? Well, I, thing? Yeah, I think when the evidence changes, you change your mind. And I think that he's done that, and that's why he's so great. But isn't the whole point about the force, and isn't the whole point of this scene, it's not like what you see with your eyes. It literally is. You have to cover your eyes. Yeah. And, like, apart from this being the mythology of baseball, it's almost like... Because <laughs> it's an American film, yeah, obviously. It is, but it, it is yeah. almost like it's not about evidence. It's about emotional... It's about, the, you know, it's the leap of faith, like in the Ind and Indiana Jones films, when you have to step out in the last crusade. Oh, if your own son is making the toys fly around his nursery or whatever it is in the middle of the night, <laughs> you're going to... You know, I do think, actually, if you, if you could make that prequel to The Force Awakens, which is essentially The Omen... Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you just start to notice your son doing these things. Um, what, what do you think, Matthew? Well, again, about... this, I find this, this puzzling because it's, it celebrates faith. It celebrates embracing something that you have no evidence for. And yet the evidence just keeps presenting itself. Um, so, I, again, I don't really understand why he's not, he doesn't come to the conclusion that he comes to in The, the Force Awakens a bit, in a, a bit more briskly. Really? Mm. Is he a humanist? Yes. Was he a humanist? Why say? not? I think so. Yeah, because he, he, he only does change his mind when he sees evidence. Until then, he's sceptical, and that's the right way of judging reality. And also, he goes on a moral journey that reveals him to be a man of good character. It's a longer journey than that, because doesn't he begin as a cynic? Which is, yes. is a very different mm. yes, kind of philosophical that, position, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think that would be, that would be a good, a good characterisation mm -hmm. of him early on. And he goes on a journey, he, his sympathies enlarge, he, he finds a cause, he... 
you know, finds connections with other people and relationships, a sense of solidarity, and he does the right thing, you know? You know, the best line in the whole of The Force Awakens for me is the one when they, they're with... Um, oh, God, John Boyega. Oh, my mind's gone blank. And they're going, they're going to try and, you know, take out the Starkiller base. And, he, and, and the John Boyega characters, Finn, Finn says... Finn. Let's use the force. And Han Solo says it doesn't work that way. But it does make you think, but how does it work? Because in yeah. what sense has the force done anything for any of what them? What has the force ever done for them? <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> you know, because they're entirely reliant on old style, you know, rebellion, aren't they, under um, Princess Leia, which actually brings me on to the next slide. Who oh. I have to say, I've always I've always would have said Luke was my favourite character, and I saw the Force Awakens and I realised really it's Leia who is amazing. And I don't know if you've seen, um, there's a great um, video, one of those people who sort of analyzes the films. There are all these deleted scenes from The Force Awakens, which is a whole sequence about why she leads a breakaway and restarts a rebellion, because it's the only way. That would have been nice to know. Wouldn't I know, yeah. she had a whole um, sort of plot. And that's why, you know when you see them blow up the Republic, all the people in that gallery, um, they all had significance. Oh. Um, but it just seems to me, and I, I was particularly interested in what you thought, Matthew, was kind of philosophy kind of perspective. The whole World War II idea about the, the, the resistance, about fighting the odds when most people are collaborating, and this is obviously the torture sequence that's about to happen in Star Wars. Um, <laughs> oh, course, yes. They improvised, and my son <laughs> yeah. improvised that torture droid yeah. using one of the, the Black R2 units. Um, but that is the detention cell on the Death Star. I just want you to know that. Just, it's shot very close up. And um, what's the next one? Oh, and so this is on, obviously with Moff Tarkin when he yeah. threatens him, he says, I'm going to blow up Alderaan yeah. if you don't tell me the location of the liberal base. That's and then good. He does that's it really good. well... Um, so the that. Yeah. I know, yeah. I yeah. Well, I mean, st World War II um, inhabits Star Wars, doesn't it? At least the first one. Um, you can you can certainly read it as a war film, and obviously the um, you know the way that the battle scenes are filmed, uh, the dogfights directly lifted from those uh, from the Battle of Britain, those aer aerial battles of at World War II, and the sense of a blitzkrieg going on across the galaxy. But I think it's there sort of at the at the shot for shot level, really. If you if you think about if you can ever you remember spending a bank holiday watching a bridge too far. <laughs> Um, there's a scene at the beginning of that where the German occupiers arrive at a chateau. And if you put that, I would like, so maybe somebody could do this, but he puts this side by side by the scene in Star Wars where, um, where the forces of the Empire um, first arrive. Um, then, it, it, I, I mean, I would love to know what the, whether there was any kind of explicit um, travelling of ideas here, because the shots are really the same. You get the, the commandant coming, standing in the doorway of the chateau with all of those soldiers lined up, and the way that he moves down <coughs> through the shot is exactly like um, that, uh, the, the famous shot of, uh, of Darth Vader um, coming through the smoke. But maybe it's just to do with the, the power of that image having an older mm. sort of heritage. Um, but it's an interesting coincidence that they both appear, they appear within months of each other. Um, yes, you're right, at the same time. Um, but also this whole idea about the odds, and although it's, you know, it's, it's joked about as a throwaway line, many Bothans died to bring us this information, that sense of anyone who's read about what, what people did mm. um, in the SOE, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of secret uh, operatives who, who were parachuted in, and the terrible dangers that they faced. And Princess Leia is kind of the lead of them, and she goes yeah. back to doing it as well. But you know what? what? I think one of the reasons, what, one of the things that slightly disappoints me about Star Wars mm. is that Princess Leia, she isn't like one of those SOE agents. Not enough. You know, SOE was, a, was an organisation in which the, the female agents did all the most important work. Mm. And I just don't think that is the case with mm. Star Wars, And really. the problem with Leia all the way through, which I find very difficult, because I want to love her. I want her to be my favourite character. Um, but the problem with her is that she is completely defined, as in a number of you know religi religions, by the male relationships in her life. It's whether yeah. it's with Luke she's, or with Han or with. Yeah, I don't just, even let her wear a bra. She's in Olivia Stoles. de Havilland. Yeah. So annoying, yeah. She's Olivia de Havilland in the uh, in um, the Adventures of Robin Hood, except that Olivia de Havilland has pages and pages and pages of lines. Yeah. Mm. So actually, if we're, you know, if we're putting those two things side by side, I think we can see Star Wars as an example of decline mm. 
yeah. or something. No, that it's frustrating. Be. I mean, the one thing I will say, um, as someone who spent far too much time on the internet researching tonight, there are some quite interesting deleted scenes from The Empire Strikes Back. And as we know about all this, the huge stuff they've taken out of The Force Awakens about her plot, but there's a scene where she realised that Luke is also going to leave the base, as well as Han Solo. And she basically says this is why I should never rely on anyone else, because I'm going to have to do it all on my own. And that sense that she's the only one, despite what you say, who is genuinely committed to this long-term cause of trying to stop, um, stop the empire. And I, I find that quite moving, mm, she's actually. Not, I mean, she's not that interesting a character in, 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 you know, in the, in the non-deleted scenes. No. <laughs> That's no, unfortunately okay. the case. Um, Rob, what have we got next? Uh... Right. So this is. Um, so thank you to Luke Doran, um, producer at uh, uh, BBC Radio Four, who brought in his Lando for us to reconstruct this. This is Lando's deal Beautiful. from um, *The Empire Strikes Back*, because I think this is an ethical uh, situation, which is not as evil as it's portrayed as. Not Let's at read all. it first. Not at all. Which one is uh, it? This is five. 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 Yeah. So I should just say. So he's escorting Han and Leia to dinner. Okay. On Cloud City. Aren't you afraid the Empire's going to find out about this little operation, shut you down? It's always been the danger that looms like a shadow over everything we've built here. But things have developed that will ensure security. I've just made a deal that will keep the Empire out of here forever. Open the door to reveal Darth Vader and bounty hunter Boba Fett. We would be honoured if you would join us. I had no choice. They arrived right before you did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry too. Now there's a line from later, which I want you to read, who's... Um, yeah, you're Lando. Can you just read that last one in brackets? Uh, it's after he's... Lord Vader, Lord to... Vader. What about Leia and the Wookiee? There was, that was never a condition of our agreement, nor was giving hand to this bounty hunter. Right. So, Lou, so we've got the situation where he runs a whole city with, what, thousands of yeah, people? exactly. The Empire has already turned up before yeah. Han Solo. As far as we can tell, the deal is you give them Han Solo and you save the lives yeah. of thousands yeah. of people. He's Why done. is that an unethical he, choice? He did completely the right thing. He, he's wow. the, he is the most moral character in the whole of Star Wars. <laughs> he, he is incredibly... He's completely done, done the right thing. He's responsible for all these people. And then, when he also later gets an opportunity to do something even more moral, i.e. join the rebels, he takes that choice too. He's, yeah. the, he's the living example of the fact that morality and moral choices happen in contexts, sometimes very difficult contexts, you know, and you have to sometimes choose the lesser of two evils. What he also is, I mean, he's a classic utilitarian, isn't he? I yeah. don't know whether Lando ever read Bentham, but... <laughs> he is Bentham. He practically I think, well, is Bentham. He may be, well, I don't know, he's either Bentham or Mill, perhaps. Oh, let's give he may be Bentham because Bentham, Bentham's utilitarianism came from the idea of not just, um, it's not just the, the greater good, the greatest good for the greater number, as Mill said. Um, it's, a, it's based on the idea of pleasure, I think. Bentham was a hedonist. Mm. Bentham thought we should all have the, should maximise the amount of pleasure in our lives um, as long as it didn't cause harm to others. And I sense that that's what Cloud City is, because what actually happens on Cloud <laughs> City? Some, isn't there some um, mining that goes on? It's quite I don't think it's that but, enjoyable, well, is it? Well, there's, they, they have a kind of, they have a sort of, uh, um, there's some industrial processing going on. They recycle their metal, don't we? We know that. Mm. Um, but it seems like one of those science fiction places where people mainly kind of sit around in, <laughs> you know, possibly drinking space cocktails. <laughs> it seems like a faintly decadent place to me. And that's why I'm slightly worried about this argument. Because is Cloud... I mean, is it worth saving Cloud City, I well, suppose, I is what I'm, I hedon what I'm Hedonism asking. isn't necessarily decadent if it's ethical mm. hedonism. It's, I mean. it's more like a Wild West outpost, isn't it? I reckon they're miners. So I reckon it's like, it's like the world of D.H. Lawrence. There's a lot of mining and there's a lot of sex. It's a very good more shower. Decadent. <laughs> miners, yeah. Sorry. Does this make Lando basically like the Pontius pilot then, of Star Wars? So oh. because basically there's the whole, you know, given that it's coming up for Easter um, in the West, and so there's this whole sense in which, you know, who are you going to release? All the crowd chants, we want Barabbas, we want Barabbas, kill the other one. And so that's what he does. He says, well, for the grace of good... This right. is different. This is, this is the Nazis have come in and they want... Someone and he's he's agreed because they've said they'll yes, let everyone else. Why is this Lando not appeasement? Why is this not Lando's Munich agreement? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, sometimes yeah. that might be portrayed not by me as as the lesser of two evils as well. I mean, that's the point, isn't it? It's very difficult. It's very hard. But doesn't he find that it has become the Munich agreement? What's that's he going to what fight with? What's he going to fight about, with? Isn't it? He's, he's not going to having peaceful time on Cloud City. What well, he's not going to weaponize Cloud City. He could have let them all get City. away, couldn't he? 
He well, when the opportunity to go, came yeah. to help them, then he took it later. Yeah. So, I mean, I think he did everything he could within the constraints of circumstances. Yeah, yeah. it's the whole of the empire. But we don't empire. trust him anyway, because we know that Han Solo owes him money. Well, that's, like, I mean, we that's know, another so it could inducement just be a, to Yeah. Our, okay. Mm. We've got another... That's true. I don't trust his motives. So, no, fair enough. Anything fair more enough. on Lando? I've got another ethical dilemma for you otherwise. So, um... Okay, I'd like to thank <laughs> Rob Stradling on Twitter who constructed this for me. This is this deleted scene from Return of the Jedi. Um, so if you remember Return of the Jedi, the commander of the Death Star, the new Death Star, um, the first scene, Darth Vader arrives and he goes, oh, what an unexpected pleasure, Lord Vader. And he says, you have to build this faster. And he, he actually, the commander says, well, actually, they're working as hard as they can. And straight away, you set up the idea of this commander as someone who is actually trying to be reasonable, is taking care of the welfare of his crew, and um, is sort of trying to do the right thing. So this scene, we've got, we've got two. This is when Darth Vader turns up and wants to just walk in and see the Emperor. It's quite a short one. This is six, yeah? This is six. So do the first bit down to the line, and then I'll change the slide. OK, so I'm him. Y you may not enter. Vader does his hand-raised throttle thing. Is this? <laughs> oh, actually, you know, I'm Diana's Darth Vader and. Oh, you. Yeah. Who's, who's yeah. the casting in this, Amira? Okay. Yeah, who do you want to be? You, you want to be Jar Jar? Do you want to be yeah, Darth Vader? I'll, 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 I'll be Darth Vader. She's a good Vader. Can you I'm be Darth Vader? Vader. Yeah. Who wants to be? I think you should be throttled this time. I throttle. Yes. I'll be throttled this okay. time. Okay, and you can you be the Emperor. You may okay. not. You may not enter. <laughs> and then through, you have to say. Thanks. Oh, sorry. I'm enjoying that bit too much. While you're being throttled, you have to say. It is the Emperor's command. I will await his convenience. Uh, very, so, sorry. Very good. So the point of this, sorry, it doesn't really sorry. work, does it? You used to see it, but we couldn't share it. Um, is that he's just following quite reasonable orders. The Emperor said no one can come in. Darth Vader starts Is this the deleted him. scene then? This is yeah, one of the yeah. two deleted scenes. Oh, I see. Um, and, you know, Darth Vader automatically starts to throttle him. And when he points out, I'm only doing what the Emperor asked me to do, which is stop anyone coming in, he goes, oh, OK, I'll wait. Um, mm. So I basically, Jer Gerard, played by Michael Pennington, who's just been nominated for an Olivier Award as Best Supporting Actor, he's amazing, um, is um, quite a terrific actor. So there's the other deleted scene, and I've had to reconstruct this. Um, so Jer Gerard's supposed to be the one in the grey uniform. I didn't have the proper thing. This is from near the end of Return of the Jedi, and Luke is, on the, um, is with the Emperor, and they're having this conversation about your friends will soon lose and you'll die. And Jer Gerard's being ordered what to do once they've got the, the end or the, the kind of um, the moon in their sights and he's got loads of soldiers down there and he's being told what to do so um, who's operative one who's the emperor who's I'm the emperor the emperor or I was oh I'm yeah. Sarah maybe been okay. deposed so no. right why do, who's the Am emperor I still you be Jared okay. who's the emperor Oh, you're the emperor. Uh, you're historically, the emperor. I have. Do you want to be? Um, <laughs> do you want to be operative one, and I'll be operative two? Yeah, I'll be do the voice. One. Do the voice. Okay. <laughs> your fleet is lost, and your friends on the Endor moon will not survive. Beep, beep, beep. Your Highness, Commander, should the rebels manage to blow up the shield generator, you will turn this battle station onto the Endor moon and destroy it. Yes, Your Highness, but we have several battalions stationed on the moon. You will destroy it. Your grave, sorry, grave unhappiness. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm afraid. Um, and so then, it, then there's all this. Then there's all the stuff that's in the film, and then it cuts back to them. Um, so you're operative one, aren't Sir, you? Sir, the rebel fleet is moving to the unfinished portion of the station. Concentrate all firepower on that sector. Point zero five to moon target. Rebel fighters have entered the superstructure. Judge Gerald thinking and then decisive. Open the power discharge gates. Flood sectors three hundred four and one three eight. That should slow them up a bit. Point zero three to moon target. Point zero two to moon target. Point zero one to moon target. Moon target in range. Sir, moon target in range, now. Sir Gerard looks down with deep regret as he says it. Commence firing. Operative. Oh, I thought that was, I thought that's the you operative well. speaking. No, that's you. No, operative no. fire. It doesn't quite work with that Michael Pennington for some <laughs> strange reason. Mm. But well done, thank you very much. Hard, <laughs> very good, lover. But I have to say, it's, um, you can get it on the Return of the Jedi DVD, and I think it might be on the internet somewhere. If you, you know, it might just. It might just. Yeah. But it's a beautiful piece of acting, because basically, he's still trying to do the right thing. He's trying to protect the welfare of his men, and he's been told to just sacrifice them all. I think there's something of this whole, the whole trope of the good Nazi who finds himself on the wrong side. 
What do you think about that? Matthew? Yes, I certainly think there is, because there's that, uh, that sense of I was only obeying orders, isn't there, in that opening scene. Um, and, um, and it's present. But it's also, a, I mean, it's a classic philosophical idea, this about do I obey the unjust law? I mean, it's one of the foundational ideas of philosophy. Um, uh, I suppose uh, Socrates is the first person to really explore this properly, a, a man who thought the law... We all cite... Well, no, OK, sorry. Whoa, whoa, no, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll, There's I'll, an ancient I'll, text yeah, of which yeah. you're unaware. Uh, uh, <laughs> Feel, feel free to correct all my, mis my mistakes. I, I will make many. But certainly Socrates thought the law was so important that that's the reason why he drank the hemlock, wasn't mm. it? Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah no, you are. Well, yeah. and as far as we know in Western cultural memory, yes. Um, but what I'm thinking is this reminds me so much of the, obviously, the biblical story in which Abraham's basically saying, you know, he tries to intercede and says, don't, don't blow up Sodom and Gomorrah. Please don't do it. And he's been able to intercede, in, you know, numerous times with Yahweh before. And Yahweh's like, yeah, all right, okay, I'll let them go. But, you know, on that occasion with Sodom and Gomorrah, he's like, no, Sodom, like literally, <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah, they're going. And it's that same kind of, so that petitioning to the higher power based on an ethical, you yeah. know, the idea that, well, yeah. these people have done nothing wrong. You know, you're going to yeah. punish them for the sake of location and context. Yes. And, you know, the higher power in the Bible, it's God. Mm. Uh, in this case, it's, it's like, no, they're going to go. Um, I mean, that's why they need all the clones, right? They, they need the clone armies precisely, precisely because of people like him, real people like him who are going to have dilemmas like that. Mm. Who, yeah, who might, who might not who press might the not button. Who might not do it. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking there's quite a lot in classical literature of the hero who fights for the wrong side. He just yeah. finds himself on the wrong side. Right. So a couple of examples. I mean, in the Iliad, there's people like Hector who yeah. happens to be on Noble. the losing side, but they're the oh, best. he's the best him. hero best in the man. Iliad. And in the Mahabharata, the, the one is Karna, who's the greatest warrior, but is, is on the wrong <coughs> side. And, and then there's and his Saul, who becomes St. Paul, because he's persecuting all the Christians, and then he becomes, you know... Absolutely. The founder of Christianity. Which way around is that, though? I don't know. <laughs> when, <laughs> when's the bit when he goes bad? Is yeah. that before or after? You said that. <laughs> I wondered if you had favourite characters, including maybe perhaps the most ethical character, or, or just favourites in Star Wars, any of the films. I do. Aunt Beru is pretty ethical, isn't Aunt she? Beru. Aunt Beru. Luke's I feel aunt. an under-investigated she... character in Star Wars. Any, any elaboration on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, she's the one who's had to kind of keep exactly. this secret and live yeah. this life yeah. and, you know, have to, have to, have to live on this uh, place in the middle of nowhere, nursing all of this yeah. knowledge, because she knows it, doesn't she? Um, and she's, uh, you know, she has all that terrible Tupperware um, <laughs> pottery in her kitchen as well, which must be Worse than death, tough. the fate worse yes. than death. But also, she seems quite... Um, Calm, doesn't she? About the day. Of course, Luke's going to go off. Yeah. yeah. There's no yeah. attempt to try yeah. and force yeah. an alternate existence on him. Well, she doesn't huff and puff about it like her husband does. Uh, does she? And she pays a terrible price. <laughs> Obi Wan lets them all die. Yes, he, he does. Lets you hate him. Hate he lets yeah. them all he die. Can talk about this? Why do you Just to suit his so purpose, much? isn't it? Well, that, like I've said, I mean, Obi Wan Kenobi does the one thing that, well, one of the main things that you must never do in your moral dealings with other people, which is to use people as you know, means to your own end. Yeah. And I think that's a really important uh, principle. Um, not just to use someone to your own end, but to go about it in such a devious and deceptive and manipulative way, letting people die, shifting events a little bit this way, a little bit that way, half-truths, you know. To be very economic, I mean, his economical, being economical with the truth is pretty... Uh, uh, really, tricky, very much, isn't it? very much. He's the worst man, not just in Star Wars, but in, in all of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think he's really dreadful. And Lando, and Lando is the best. Um, can, I, can I talk about my favourite character? Yeah, because I think that the great unsung hero of Star Wars is R2-D2. Uh. Not just because... <laughs> but it's true. Not just because he's kind of cute and, you know, there's this whole theory that supposedly he's drawn on Toto from The Wizard of Oz and all this kind of stuff. It, he is the travelling redeemer. Um, he is the one that can negotiate that, that sort of divide between the divine space and the kind of mortal space. He's like the new Moses. He's carrying the secret writings in him. He's the one that goes off into the wilderness 
to find this kind of divine, yes. like prophetic yeah. figure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He engineers everything. He's like, he's like Moses, who says, oh, I'm not very good at speaking. You're going to have to get other people to speak for me. Turns out, amazing at speaking, but only to the people that can understand him, who have got the knowledge. So Yoda, he comments all the time. He, R2-D2 mm. comments all the time on stuff that Luke's doing when he goes to the underworld, into mm. the forest. Yoda understands him, and Yoda's like, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Obi-Wan is like, yeah, you're right, you're right. It's R2-D2 that understands that he has to find Ben Kenobi, that he has to deliver this oracle message from the great goddess slash princess Leia. <laughs> R2-D2, and he's the one that like guides, he's like on the little spaceship, right. guiding yeah. like the you're whole right. rebel yeah. like attack. He is the great unsung yeah, hero. He I love him. He's got all the maps. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, that's true. Um, God, that's so and he looks good. a little bit like my pedal bin, which I like to... I, I find that I've really turned against Luke because oh, of the I Force hated him Awakens. from the beginning. And the thing about Luke is, you know, he's like that sort of dodgy uncle who says, yeah, I've set up this school, I'm going to use my philosophy, and give me your son and I'll train him. And then look what happens. Mm, exactly. And then he runs off for the next however many years and hides. Yeah. 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 How yeah. is that useful? In fact, as a Jedi, Luke must be the, the worst Jedi well, ever. <laughs> he but had he the never worst finished teacher. his training. That's why. Yeah, exactly. They're all, I mean, all of them, it's just like some ghastly apostolic succession of failure all the way down from Obi-Wan Kenobi and then to And it's purely and patriarchal, which is why, why we need, we needed the new film. We mm. needed Ren. We need this kind of, like, uh -huh. she is going to seriously shake it up. Yeah, you see, though, you know, and I wonder where this is going, so this is all speculation. I just know she's going to end up being the daughter of somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas mm. actually what would be so brilliant is if she wasn't anybody. Exactly. Yes. She's just some girl. Some rude girl, Some girl, like we were talking about before. Some yeah. rude girl that just turns up yeah. and takes over. Yeah, something chavvy, I know. Yeah, it's exactly. So cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> have we got mics, by the way, at all? So we can take questions, we do. So I want to take questions in a sec, but I want to ask um, everyone else about... So this is this idea I saw. Um, Bill Nye, the mechanical engineer, it's known as the science guy, recently told Rolling Stone magazine um, that scientists... What? Gone. Gone. Um, that scientists prefer Star Trek over Star Wars because it's about science, not magic. But it seemed to me that there's something about Star Wars and its epic storytelling, which does draw on myths and religious ideas, that somehow draws a greater adoration because of that spiritual epic nature of its storytelling. What are your thoughts on this? I feel you know my views. You, you know, the, don't. The, that's true. I, obviously, okay. I have. I, I can, this I can is a room of people who, who bought yeah. tickets to come and talk about Star Wars, though, so <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, well, uh, late, later on in this year, I'm going to Germany actually to speak about, to give a, a keynote speech at a, at a conference on Star Trek and humanism. And that makes this evening my second favourite uh, oh. event. <laughs> oh, I've lost you all, I know, I know. <laughs> so that's my view. But of course, def definitely, if you, want, if you want a rational, humanistic approach to science fiction, Star Trek is obviously going to be your favourite, um, over, over and above uh, Star Wars. But that's why Star Trek is boring, because oh. who wants, oh my who God. wants rational, you logical... So, I much prefer Star Wars. I like the Shameless myth. playing I, to the room. <laughs> yeah. I love true. mythology. I, I love the whole Star idea. Star Trek's got I loads think... of mythology. Come oh, what? On. They there want to put so a whale on episodes. Star Wars. <laughs> Star Trek, yeah. They have. No, it's but I, I, I just think there's something, there's something about... Um, Star Wars has got its problems. It's got its problems in terms of Orientalism. It's got its, its problems in terms of a class structure. It's got its massive problems in terms of a, a patriarchy. Um, Star Trek is so speciesist that I find what? it. It's so speciesist. I, I find it almost it's got unbearable the coolest to watch. Mixed species character in the exactly. universe. Exactly. Hey. Part of it, Mr. Spock. Spock. Oh please. <laughs> <laughs> Organ now, if he was a woman, I would be more interested. He, and nearly I, was. he would automatically think, oh, he's a bit more interested. <laughs> well, he nearly was. I think he Paul. should have been, shouldn't he? To Paul. Or, to Paul's no. A woman. No, I'm not, no, I'm wrong about I that. Think you're making but there up. was a Spock like character, wasn't there, in the. Uh... Was it Mrs. Spock? No, no it wasn't, wasn't no. Mrs. Spock. In Enterprise, there was a female character, a very interesting female character who didn't make it past oh, the pilot episode. Oh, okay. Was she the one who took all her clothes off in the shower in the first episode of so, Star Trek yeah. Voyager? No, I've never seen that. No. Oh, and yes, it was it was Enterprise, wasn't it? Enter There's Enterprise, the opening Enterprise, episode. Yeah. They have to they have to go in the shower together and put on some special gel on there for their mission. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe it's a little bit more interesting. Than I thought. <laughs> 
I think they have they have different strengths and weaknesses. These two see, these two things. Don't they? Star Wars is a, a is a big disadvantage in a way. There's not that much of it. I mean, you know, science fiction fans like things to have years of material yeah. to uh, yeah. devote yeah. themselves to and and sniff out the complexities in. There's not that much of Star Wars. It's very broad brush, really. It's but very simple. The people as well. in it have very little screen time, yeah. so they they've had no opportunity to develop into, I think, the very real human beings mm. that uh, that Spock and Seven McCoy and Vangus. Kirk and Hora and those people are. Except that, may, that that quite a lot of Star Trek is like. Um, um, is like group therapy or the, <laughs> the meeting of the subcommittee on something. They all care so much about how, how we, what the procedure is and, and how, uh, how, uh, how the, everything feels. And I think, actually, in a way, I'd rather live in the much more unstable and, sc and scary and Manichaean universe of Star Wars than the kind of the compliance culture of Star Trek, where you basically have to subscribe to uh, the values of the Federation. Well, or... there's Deep Space Nine for people like you, isn't there? <laughs> 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 the, the, the Star Trek <laughs> universe give, give, has something for everyone. You know, got this whole theory that, that Bill Clinton, or rather Captain Kirk, is actually Bill Clinton in space. <laughs> Let's just savour that for a moment. <laughs> Does anyone want to ask a question? Right, we have. Can we get a microphone? Or give an answer. This yeah, I'm answering audience right. than a question. Can we take the one in um, that row first? And do we have another? We'll take the lady on this side here next. Yes, um, it's a gentleman down towards that far side of the row. Y you're a gentleman. That's no gentleman. That's Bob from the office. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would just like to question Andrew Copson's ethics. So. Mm. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's the wrong way of putting stop. it. <laughs> I'll ask for a clarification. On the one hand, you said that Obi-Wan Kenobi was oh, the worst right. person I, in the universe for throwing say. everyone under a bus, but Lando yeah. Calrissian is the best person in the universe for doing exactly the same he uh, didn't thing. Do it. So no, I knew you were going to say Is it means Bob. to end, or is it utilitarian? He did, he did, Lando did not do exactly the same thing, because Lando made a split-second decision, um, you know, ch prioritising the welfare and his responsibility of all those people um, over the alternative. Obi-Wan Kenobi set out on a many decades, you know, scheme. It does matter. It, is, it does make a difference. Well, no, but I don't agree with that. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that the, the end is always the only important thing about your ethics. I think the sort of person you are does matter as well. The extent to which you're, you know, manipulating other people, the sort of devious character that you might be, and using other people in that way. No, I don't. Well, but Lando only did it for a very brief moment. Okay. <laughs> so whereas Obi, Obi Wan Kenobi made a lifetime's work out of it, and if that's not, you know, if that's not okay. worse, then Thank you. you can continue this afterwards, maybe. Forgive him. <laughs> I haven't forgiven him. Let's take. Where's the microphone over here? You can take yes. Um, uh, so you know that Darth Vader fulfills essentially the prophecy that he. Um, overrules the empire by killing the emperor. Do you think that reflects a deterministic universe? Is he like morally praiseworthy for doing this or is it just always fated to be like that? Good question. Mm. No, very good question, yeah. Do, 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 does anybody make, real, make a real moral choice in, in Star Wars or is the, are the forces of this universe compelling them to do the things that they, they, they do. do? Well, La what, Lando's in an interesting position there then, mm, isn't he? Mm, mm. Well, I think this is the, same. the answer to, the, to that in the Star Wars universe has to be the same answer as it is in our universe, which is you know, probably everything's determined, but it doesn't make much sense to live that way in practice, so you have to live as if you've got free will and judge people on that basis. Which people is... like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah. <laughs> and Han Solo is that one character who does live in that way, as if he, he does make the best choices he can, he whether or not he has any ultimate control over them. Yeah, but so many true. of the characters seem, their actions are, are sort of determined by their genealogy as yeah. well, aren't they? It's not just the, 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 the nature of the universe. It's that they're somehow stuck in these stories true, because actually. of what their parents have done. There's a Greek have, tragedy, have Oristea Agamemnon yeah. type thing, about, especially about the, like, the palace drama of the lives of the Skywalker family, which mm. seemed to motivate everything else. It's kind of very Oedipal as well, though, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it is. It's the whole Leia thing. Okay, it's not quite the mother, but she's almost the mother figure, yeah. and the whole Luke yeah. Yeah. and Leia, and, you know, it's... Yeah. it's, it's very, very generative. Mm. Yeah. And how come she never gets to train as a Jedi, as far as we can tell? You know, they what give her would the reason be? Yeah. 
Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, in 1977. Have a penis, that's why. <laughs> no, but even now. Um, right, we'll take that question near the end there. And then there's another one on this side. Um, we'll take that one sort of nearer the back with the person with the glasses. And that one there. Whoever gets the mic first, ask it first. Yeah, that, that gentleman down that one. I think you're going to get the microphone first on the right. There's loads of questions up there. Hi there. Oh, and we'll, have you got mics upstairs? We'll come upstairs yeah. next, promise, for the next four. Go for it. One of the things I wanted to ask about was the idea of balance. Very early on, they talk about bringing balance to the force. Uh, and it's an idea that kind of goes away again and comes back at the start of The Force Awakens. I think they talk about it again. I might be wrong about that. Um, but we talked earlier about the force and the idea that it's not necessarily good or bad. It's just light and dark. There's not necessarily a moral judgment to that. What would you say, are there any historical and cultural antecedents to the idea of balance? And does that make a moral difference to these characters? Are they acting in an unbalanced way? Is Luke Skywalker, is Yoda unbalanced for pursuing a light side agenda? Thank you. Mm. So yes, the idea of balance and the force, how far um, we see characters acting in a way um, which is sort of affected by it. And it does seem to be sometimes it's talked about just as balance and other times it's talked about as good mm. and evil. What are your mm. thoughts? On? I think there's something very Japanese um, about the idea of, of light and dark, of it being not a moral judgment, but simply... So is that totally total morally forces? neutral then? It's not, there's no preference expressed really for one or the other. It, it is something about being in balance, is it light and dark? Well, yeah. I've, certainly, certainly yeah. the Japanese films I've seen. But, sure. but, but, you know, obviously I'm going to bring it back to the Bible, but the Bible is exactly the same. So um, the idea is that there's order and chaos, there's light and dark, um, there's day and night, uh, and, and you can't have one without the other. So one has to exist for the other to exist. And so you necessarily, that's what the whole of Genesis 1 is all about. It's about separation. Mm. So about saying you separate order out of chaos. And as a result, you know, so you need to have, you need to have a bit of bad to have the good. You can't, you, you, one can't exist, one is just, can't exist without the but other. in terms of the character's motivation in the films, do you think we can, we can see anything of that? working through or is it too from Matthew says it sounds like the films aren't smart enough to do anything interesting with these I know, but maybe you can maybe Darth Vader's a really good example of the of the way in which you do need that kind of ultimately despite his attempts to be complete you know he's been so dark that actually his redemption scene mm. you know he doesn't only just kind of reconnect with but that's with tension his son. more than balance isn't yeah, but it? then he that's, kills the emperor well that's the breaking of the tension in one decisive direction it's not bad there's no it's not balance is it yeah, but it's coming back from where he was. Yeah, there's a kind of momentum of extremes. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? I just wonder whether, you know, again, because this, this is a product of the 70s and a product of, uh, of California, mm -hmm. whether there is a, there's a kind of environmental element to that idea of balance. Um, you know, the idea of... Uh, it's, we're not quite into Gaia yet, are we? Although... I think those ideas are kind of are swashing Gaia around. Theory, in, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's, well that's then, we'll, then, then, then I'll say that's what it is. Then in that case, <laughs> um, uh, because we're, we are aware of because of the different environments of these planets. Um, aren't we, that there are these... Uh, uh, the destruction of Endor seems to be... Uh, the attack on Endor, rather, seems to be a, um, a very negative thing, doesn't it? That seems a, a strange kind of utopia. That's the most... I mean, the, 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 the land of the Ewoks. Oh, that, that is Endor, isn't it? Yeah, well, basically, no, it Avatar, the film, yeah. is, is essentially just that element of Return of the Jedi, isn't it? You know. Yes, it's certainly set in... Yes, what looks like a kind of prog rock album of the uh, cover <laughs> of, the, Eden. of the, <laughs> Eden of the of 70s. Primitive. But the <laughs> idea of the, the forest and of, of a certain kind of sweetness as well. Um, and, you know, in the, in the new film, there's a, the, when they power up their weapon and destroy those planets, staging the destruction of a planet is something that Star Wars seems deeply interested in and <laughs> returns to, to, I mean, more than probably other science fiction uh, uh, series. Um, uh, the act of exploding a planet seems to be one that it's quite preoccupied by. And the, the destruction of all of those planets in, um, in The Force Awakens was, uh, was shocking, wasn't it? That so was if a... you've destroyed that sun, wouldn't all the planets die anyway? Oh, it, well, I sat next to a physicist watching it. I'm afraid he, he didn't stop laughing all the way through that rather distracting. <laughs> but, um, but I was rather, rather, um, rather taken with it. Okay. I think you'd make an excellent commander of a Death Star, actually, with a, <laughs> with a plan like that. Mm. that really... um, there was a question here. Who had the microphone? Yes. Yeah, um, I, just before I get to the question, I, I don't know if this will change anyone's views, but I thought I'd point out a little bit about Bespin. 
Um, not too it's, much, it, Not too much, no. It, it is millions, not thousands. I think six or seven million. And it's got two industries, one of which is um, tourist-based, which is Cloud City, and the other is mining, which is usually based elsewhere, but requires actual Cloud City to be functional, otherwise they're all dead, just from being stranded. Okay. So I don't know if that will change anyone's views on that. Um, Very useful information. <laughs> yeah. I hope I can actually say this quickly. In one of the games, possibly the most popular game on Star Wars, is called Knights of the Republic. Um, you're playing as someone who converts to being a Jedi quite late in life, although you later find out you actually hadn't, you're born a Jedi, but going back to the question. Um, you're questioning one of the characters about whether you do actually have any choice, and the character responds, Jedi have the ultimate choice. You have the choice to fall or to stay true to the light side. Now, you've already touched on deterministic uh, aspects of Star Wars. If it's true then that you can choose whether to be light or be dark, how does that actually affect the uh, moral stance of determinism? Darth Vader chose to be evil. Yeah. Does that mean that he is therefore morally bad from everything he did from there, or is it just that first choice which makes him evil? I would say it's the act of choosing um, within both Star Wars universe, but also within our kind of Western yeah. cultural universe. I would say it's the act of choosing, because we all know that we could be we all know the choices we could make. We all know that we could be bad. Um, but most of us choose or try really bloody hard not to be bad. Um, some of us harder than <laughs> some of us try harder than others. But yeah, but the idea of the fallenness as well is, is an interesting one because it suggests that we've all been, you know, within Star Wars, as in a number of uh, religions, it suggests that you, you start from a, a, a moment of um, privilege. And, and hence the aristocracy thing, actually. And then you, you mm. can make a choice. So even mm. something as, you know, as um, sort of that permeates our, our, our own culture, something like the Garden of Eden idea, you know, which is not about a fall, it's about an expulsion, but it's the idea of choice, that you are told, if you do this, this will happen, if you do that, this mm. will happen, but you still make the choice. Um, <laughs> so I think it's the moment of choice rather than... And I don't think it necessarily cancels out what you've done before. Okay. We've got some questions upstairs. Where's the microphone? We've got one up there. Okay. Um, so we'll take that one there, and then got, I'll ask. I'll get four questions at the top if there are four at the top. Take that one first. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, the question I wanted to ask um, it kind of goes towards the Attack of the Clones, and so it goes towards from, the what? Towards Attack of the Clones okay. up until the video Can game. Can I just say now, prequel? Those prequels. Uh, so I can't guarantee. Yeah. One that we've all care okay. enough. All right. but but also <laughs> <laughs> we care. <laughs> um, but, but also that, but I mean, I have, seen, I have seen Attack of the Clones once. I'm not sure okay. how much we okay. would have. Okay, but it then goes into a video game which some in the audience might be aware of called The Force Unleashed 2. And my question really is, because it really centers around clone armies, okay. is that a slight nod to the dangers of childhood indoctrination indoctrination from your Judeo-Christian religions like Islam, Christianity, um, would you say there's like not to that with clone armies? Yes or no and why? To, I, I think that's, yeah, I mean, I, you know, what I was saying earlier about uh, the empire being essentially, you know, the monotheistic uh, church sort of in its advance uh, uh, to destroy uh, previous ways of being, absolutely the clone armies are very much a part of my uh, theory uh, about that. I, See, think, I it's, think it's, it's a cop out. typical. Because, a cop out. Yeah, because the thing about soldiers is, you know, it, it's convenient to think of them as clones because then you don't have to yeah. think about that but they, they were probably are forced clones, to. Though. And I know, that's why they're <laughs> <they're clones. laughs> um, But also the whole use of child soldiers, which, I mean, you'll, you'll know, the, um, the Ottoman Empire. You know, you know, did recruit these um, sure. genisteries from different places. Yeah. And in The Force Awakens, you see Finn as a child. Mm. He's obviously mm. been, ah. you know, indoctrinated since very young age, which is actually quite horrific. It is. I, mean, I felt that it was drawn from um, Aldous Huxley, that as oh. well, too, that this uh, the Brave New World, where, where children are, 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 bought, are kind of conceived in vitro and then don't emerge from the laboratory until all of their conditioning is ready, so never meet their biological parents. But it's also and the idea that somehow, you know, that if the divine source, the force, is, you know, the kind of the, the be-all and end-all, everything, you, you need to 
pay your dues. It's like a tithe, and we see this like in all sorts yeah. of ways. You know that, that children are given over to, mm. you know, to, to service of the the force or the Jedi. But what is really positive so far anyway is that the character of Finn does rebel against all that indoctrination and actually him. makes these moral choices and goes on that journey. Although I have this terrible feeling he's going to turn out to be Lando's son, isn't he? Oh. <laughs> you know, you oh, just God. know. Well, you'll they've you'll, got, they'll they've all got be something in common son. that they not many will. other people in the films have in common. So uh, I think oh, that's, yeah. that's, that's, kind of, that's you know, What are the other options? Right, next question. Where's the microphone now? Right, we'll take it back this way. Um, there's one of the glasses there, and then I'll take that one, and then we've got, yeah, we'll take those, and then we'll come back downstairs. So that was it, that one there. Then the back row, and then you. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Hi. Um, so there was an article today in History Today about whether empires are truly bad, and I would be quite interested to find out whether you think that the empire is morally very bad when the republic was morally very good, bearing in mind in the prequels, if you care. Um, <laughs> There's a blockade by a trade, you know, by a trade uh, uh, franchise which can blockade an entire planet because that's not a problem. Uh, and also, it's interesting talking about you know, the Janissaries, but you have to remember that Janissaries uh, had the opportunity to become the leaders of their empire. So apart from being the Sultan, who was obviously the ruler, they were actually the, the bureaucratic control. Yeah. So is that such a bad thing? I still feel in the problematic terrain of the prequels where the racial stereotyping of the Trade Federation was so offensive mm. that it's hard to, um, to, to read too much into it. But I don't know if you have any thoughts about no, I think that's a good, the I think, empire itself. It's a good point, a, isn't it? I mean, you know, there's, there's a question there to be asked. Under which system, the Republic in, in, in the prequels or the, or the Empire uh, in the original three films, under which system do you think most people in the galaxy were better off, you know... Uh, <laughs> it, I don't know the question. Was the Empire the, the Weimar obviously. Republic in some way? Um, well, I mean, sorry, well, the um, you know the Republic. Yeah, there was the Republic. The Weimar oh, it was the Republic, Republic the Weimar yes. Republic? What you, so, well, I don't know because it, it never looked very the, free or well, interesting. It's some the version of Plato's Republic, isn't it? Uh, with its with its guardians that administer everything and its oh, philosopher king. Oh yeah, isn't it? Surely the philosopher king is a figure that uh, I mean, this is what Anakin. Uh, wishes for and desires. Or, um, um, that figure strikes me as being rather important. And those figures were... The idea of the philosopher king is still one that's rather alive in political philosophy. I mean, Ted Cruz laid into the idea of the philosopher king during the Republican debates, talking, saying that the Federal Reserve was run by philosopher, philosopher kings, kings who'd had this terrible effect upon us. And certainly... Philosopher kings were also identified with um, uh, with figures like Hitler mm. and Stalin mm. and Mao. Mm. And Popper wrote against them mm. in that context. So I think that that uh, you know if we're I mean, who knows really because who knows what these things really represent. But um, but. Uh, the, the Republic doesn't seem a particularly desirable system to it doesn't. me. It depends how you judge what's good and what, whether people's lives are good or not. I mean, you might think that democracy, where each person can sort of develop themselves, have a say in the, the running of societies, and therefore get the sort of fulfilment that they get by participation, is a, is a better way of being. Um, than, than an empire where they have dis where they're disadvan disenfranchised and only But it's restricted democracy, though, isn't it? Because in, ultimately, today, well, today the, and in the Star Wars yeah. universe, it well, would be restricted. They have an aristocracy as well, don't they? Yeah, they do. It's a mixed constitution, rather like the UK. Do you think they could have had, um, like, the Republic could have had a kind of Brexit-style vote about, you know, <laughs> whether you wanted to. Um, keep with the existing... Because it's a very complicated system, isn't it? All that stuff about trade rules. Mm. You know, they've probably had rules about roaming charges. And I think the whole referendum would fit very well as one of the long-term tactics of the Chancellor, actually, in his, in his long route towards... I can just imagine being... a really boring roller capture yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, next question. You've got the, most, the microphone already there. Yeah, we'll take this one, and then we'll go up to the gentleman at the back row. He doesn't want to ask the question. Oh, you don't want to? Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to bring up how some of the themes have been touched upon in this discussion, such as... Okay, we don't have time for a big thing. Can you give us a question or a brief comment? Because you've only got a few minutes. I want to get some more questions in. Okay. Uh, outside of the films, in the Star Wars universe, there is a view of the Force known as Potentium which is that the Force has no inherent evil, and that the potential for light and dark resides in the individual user, okay. not in the Force itself, yep. which stands in contrast with the 
traditional Jedi view that the dark side has a distinct existence within the Force okay. and using it... Yeah, so what's your question? Is corru uh, what's your question? Leads to corruption. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I didn't know that. I really just wanted to he hear your thoughts on whether that kind of view of the Force should be explored more often within uh, St Star Wars lore because it creates such a contrast in terms of meta-ethics, okay. etc., from what we're used to. Does anyone want to add anything? Because we have talked a lot about the Force, but the basis of that, is there anything you want to say? I mean, I just, I'm just happy to have heard that, because I think that in, <laughs> in, its, in itself, that's an interesting and useful point. Yeah, I, I, I suppose whether they should ex explore it more, I don't know. But it just seems to me the Force doesn't really do anything. It's just referred to a lot. See, yeah, um, that, that, that's... I mean, I can make sense. Why pe I know, I understand why people are disillusioned with the Force. You know, <laughs> to, to today, because it does seem that it doesn't, you know, have any intrinsic qualities of it uh, of its own. So I think that it would be something worth exploring in a film. Okay. Yeah. I've got questions down here, right? Um, let's take the one at the very back, and then I'm going to take Lady in the spotty thing here. Sorry, slightly to piggyback on that last question, I wonder if the Force is a way of of all of the characters renouncing their own agency. It is a way in which, and the reason why this film caught the popular imagination in the late 70s was that politically and culturally, the sense of human agency and the sense of a positive future was renounced. So that the experience of the Vietnam War, which Lucas said he drew very strongly on in the terms of uh, a technological superpower, the United States being defeated by yeah, yeah. a technologically inferior enemy, the Viet Cong, um, whether this represented culturally the closure of the future and also the force itself is perhaps like the great uh, like the late alexander walker the film critic who had a vociferous hatred of this film <laughs> um uh, whether whether this represented the re-infantilization i mean i, I have to lay my cards Infa on the table infantilization re, re, re infantilization of yeah. of uh, popular imagination okay. I, yeah. I, okay, no, let's, let's answer I, I absolutely yeah. agree with that and i think just to come back briefly to the star trek uh, question. One of the things that Star Trek is all about, you know, especially in the original series, is human agency, is this idea that, you know, at some point in the future, by their efforts, taking their destinies into their own hands, solving their problems, building together, coming together, you know, creating together, human beings have managed to propel themselves, you know, into the, the universe on these amazing journeys and deal with these things uh, as they arise. And that is the sort of optimistic view about human potential that characterizes a lot of uh, science fiction of the Star Trek sort and beforehand. And you're right that in, in, in Star Wars, that, that's, that's quite absent. You know, people, people tend to do things because their fathers have or because the Force has helped them yeah. or whatever. It's quite fatalistic. Yeah. I think this completely supports my theory about R2-D2. In, <laughs> <sense that, laughs> in the sense that, you know, it's only the AIs that actually are given some kind of, that yeah. have their own agency. Yeah. Yeah. Primarily R2-D2, but then BB-8 as well. And, 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 you know, whereas everybody else is completely governed by their sort of imagined or, you know, genetic inheritance and, and sort of pedigree. And he even goes into a kind of catatonic state, doesn't he, through most of The Force Awakens. If only he'd switched on earlier. So they're the only he ones knows. who are really immune from The Force. Yeah, yeah. Those droids. I, genuinely... Honestly, let's do another thing on R2-D2. Just because <laughs> I just think he's amazing. <laughs> Matthew? I think Star Wars consoled an audience who were um, traumatised by Vietnam and Watergate and uh, the political upheavals of the, of the early 70s. Um, and I think also, in a way, it saved cinema as well. Um, there were, there were lots of people in the mid-70s, the early 70s, who thought that cinema was going to vanish, except as a sort of luxury activity that you maybe did once or twice a year, like getting on a coach and going to see a show in town, and that all cinemas would close, except there would be one big one in a, in a major city, and you would go and maybe visit it once a year. Ronald Neem, who directed The Poseidon Adventure, um, uh, told me this, that they, um, that they really thought it was going to go. And Star Wars is a retreat back to something, I think. It represents a kind of move back to a sort of cinema that its makers associated with the 1930s and 40s. Um, a much more, as we've said, or as I've said anyway, a more morally simple mm -hmm. uh, world. Um, a world where things are very clearly defined, where that sort of um, adventure is possible. 
Um, in a culture where everybody's seen that adventure isn't possible, or at least if you do it, you come home blind or with one leg or in a body bag. Um, and yet, it's, it, it's the reason why that didn't happen. And it restored cinema to a sort of classic, neoclassical tradition, really, I think. And whatever you think about it, um, uh, you can be sceptical about it, I think. But it helped cinema to survive, perhaps in a form that not everybody is, is comfortable with. Maybe we would like to live in a world where there were more taxi drivers or more midnight cowboys. Instead, we live in a world where we've got Batman versus Superman, God, which is the child yeah, well, exactly. of Star Wars, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, you love that So... Game. It's created this neoclassical architecture that mainstream cinema now has to live in, I think. But it could have been a ruin, and there could have been nothing. It's yeah. amazing. Um, can you make your question a brief one? The, the, yeah, have you just, that's the last one. Oh. Sorry. Um, to bring it back to your earlier radicalization theory, uh, taking it from Leia's side, she's either, again, self-radicalizing in her bedroom and joining this rebellion, or a product of state-sponsored terrorism. Um, what is that ethically more or less dubious so than who, Luke? Who's the product of state-sponsored terrorism? Leia, if Alderaan is encouraging her to become a rebel. Ah. Oh, is she a victim of state-sponsored terrorism? An agent of state-sponsored terrorism? Yeah, or a victim. Or a victim. I mean, I, I just think she's actually a really morally <sighs> interesting character. Um, and maybe it's partly because I've got older. I think a lot of us who've grown up with, with Star Wars. The idea that her son has turned against everything she fundamentally believes in is, um, is incredibly moving, mm. I think. And the idea that you still wouldn't let go, that even when your son's done these terrible things, um, I, you, know, you still hold on to the idea that he can be rescued because you remember him as that little kid. Have you seen that great thesis about why Chewbacca doesn't kill Kylo Ren? That, you know, because he's up there and he's got that amazing, accurate crossbow. And when he sees what happens, he has a flashback and remembers that little kid that he played with and took care of. And he can't quite bring himself to kill him. It's incredibly moving, this little cartoon. Any thoughts on this, the whole idea of, um, of, of terrorism and, and state-sponsored terrorism rather than jihad as such? I think you have to go so far outside of the text to find anything interesting mm. about Princess Leia that I don't... I mean, yeah. I think that the... No, no, I But disagree. I just can't, I can't I see it. I mean, those deleted scenes that you've talked about add a lot of interest to her. Obviously, in the, in the latest film, she, she has something. But I just... I, don't, I can't even answer that question because I don't think we've even got the, you know, the material to do it with. I think she's just sort of been conjured out of, out of no backstory at all because she's not a fully formed character. Leia seems to me to be the kind of, if, if she were this kind of victim of state-sponsored terrorism or kind of jihadi movement, I would expect to see someone like Leia educating younger people, and we don't ever see that at all. Not mm. even in, in the new film with Ray, we don't really see that opportunity for, for one woman educating another, and I think that's, it's that sort of education scene, not even when she's commanding, you know, she's standing around and war tables and she's you know, plotting here, there and everywhere. But you never see her actually educating anybody and that's why I find her a very unbelievable character. She, she does have total moral certainty as well, which is always quite unbelievable, I think. Like, she's not... She's, up, she's Debbie deviate, Reynolds' daughter. <laughs> no, she struggles with whether to Do get off with Han Solo or not. She does struggle. These are not the biggest questions when there are empires and uh, republics fair, coming uh, it's from quite a big question. <laughs> it's, quite, it's, not, it's, it's no quite question, question at all, Francesca. <laughs> <laughs> The answer's obvious. Matthew, any closing thoughts? I'm not sure I have any thoughts about that, except to say I find it, there's something, I find it rather moving, in a way, to discover, actually, that there is, that this, these films have created this architecture parallel to them in which you are all having these thoughts and considering these debates. We have to end it. Um, can I just say thank you for all the terrific questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you to my husband and kids for the Lego. And thank you to <laughs> a, a wonderful panel, uh, Matthew, Francesca and Andrew. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for coming.